Geoholic. I guess I didn't know that either. <laughs> I like that song anyway. Um, he's got an interesting story, that guy. Uh, yes, yes, he does. And we'll get to it here in a minute, I suppose. But um, uh, the biggest thing when I was doing some research on him is how he got the Jelly Roll name. I, of course, thought it was because he's a larger individual. That's what I always thought. Right? Yeah. That is not the case. It is, if I remember this correctly, it's like the layers of a jelly roll because he has so many layers to his life story. Mm, not really, but I think, close. I think it's a story. Okay. Well, yeah. it, it mentions that in the thing. Oh, you I got it? Okay. Second, Perfect. But... All right. Cool. Well, uh, we'll get to that here in a minute. Though. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome episode... to the Geoholics. Two oh one. Two... 201. 201. We um, are on the other side. We are. I'm not used to saying the two. I know. I'm, I right? got a little, uh, <laughs> a little choked up there, I think. Uh, it was a good episode, that that episode 200. It was great. Yeah, I can't yeah, wait. Yeah, I can't yeah, wait for people yeah. to listen to that one. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there's a point where you just stop saying the episode number and you just it's just known as the guest? You know what I mean? <laughs> No, I like think... Joe Rogan doesn't say episode one thousand five hundred and forty-two. Yeah, I, I think once you get into the thousands, oh, is that the benchmark? Maybe, yeah, or maybe over like five hundred. Like, okay, okay, that's probably more likely. I, I think we're still in the number column because okay. we're really Fair excited enough. to get this many episodes. All right, let's. Uh, our good friend uh, Doctor Nix with us this evening. How hey you guys, been, buddy? How we doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, glad good. to be back. What's new with you? I'm just glad we made it past like episode 20. We're like 10 <laughs> times past that. <laughs> Holy cow. Somehow they keep the lights on. You guys are doing something right. And you know, the scary thing was, I think I was like episode one or two uh, after two. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. You were episode two. Yeah, that's and, right. And, and Mark Taylor was three. Was he? Yep. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And, oh, yeah, so and, awesome. And Peter was 100. Oh, well, that's really, she's an afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. No, I'm doing. I'm doing good, me, guys. Hang yeah, on, yeah. let me go ahead and text her. So when you hear <laughs> yeah, yeah. this, you're not an afterthought. <laughs> she, she immediately oh, logs in. We have another guest. <laughs> right. Yeah, we could not do it without Peter. That's for sure. Yeah. Remember. Hands this, down. And remember, this is live on YouTube. So. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Peter. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. We love you. <laughs> oh man. Um, probably getting to be conference season for you, huh? Yeah, we're gonna we're starting to tee up some travel. I, I think we're all gonna be at Geo Week uh, next next month. Uh, we've yep. got a couple uh, of history will. conferences yes. coming. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Looking forward some to that state one. Shows. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Yeah, Geo Week's always a blast. Uh, Denver's a. I don't know about y'all. I, I like I like the Mile High City. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, we love big it. fan, big yeah. fan. Unless your flight gets canceled because it snows. <laughs> Right. <laughs> then all of a sudden you don't like it so much. But uh and of course we have producer Sean. What's up, buddy? Hello, hello. How you been? Uh very good. Uh you know, it's it's that time of the year. Yeah. The holidays are done. The Busy. the other holidays done. You know, we're in full weeks now. Yeah. And uh it's it's we're in Phoenix. It's the busiest time to be in this area. And the best time. Uh obviously the best time. You got Barrett Jackson coming up, you got the open coming up, you got mm. the Super Bowl, and then we hop on and go to Denver for Geo Week. And mm-hmm. uh usually this time of year you blink and then it's Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. And then uh the rest of the year just kind of rolls through. But it's a great time to be here. You know, just gearing up. What about you? What's new? It's, What's it's new warming up a little bit too fast for me, though. It was like 75 today. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, me, just busy, man. Just busy with work. Been traveling a lot. Yeah. Um, it's been great. I mean, lots of lots of things. Lots of really good things happening. Yeah. yeah I'm super excited. It's an exciting time to be in the positions that we're in because there's Indeed. a lot of happening. Definitely. And uh, we're just about ready to finalize our 2024 Friends of the Program. Yes. So that list should officially get released probably probably next week for yep. sure. Yep. For sure. But super excited. We got of course a bunch of the the ones that have been loyal Pretty to us. Pretty much from, everyone's coming back from day one. New, we got some new, some new exciting new, ones. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We're gonna mention one of them this evening. Probably a couple, as a matter of fact. Um, so yeah, everything's good and uh just very, very 
thankful for our listeners, our friends of the program, everybody involved that uh, keeps this thing going. Absolutely. And it keeps me motivated. I, I still look forward to this as much as I did probably the first week. But with a lot less anxiety, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, a lot less anxiety. <laughs> yes, that's that's correct. <laughs> for sure. All right, tell us about that opening number. Uh, you talked about them. That yeah. was Jelly Roll. Okay. That was a song called "Need a Favor." Uh, here we go. Jelly Roll, aka you know his name, Jason DeFord. Did not know an, that. Is an American rapper, singer, and songwriter known for his versatility in blending various music genres. Uh, he is from Antioch, Tennessee. His journey in the music industry began in the early 2000s. His stage name is a nod to his multi-layered nature of his music, representing a fusion of hip-hop, country, and rock influences. <laughs> Jelly Roll gained recognition for his raw and honest storytelling, often drawing from his own life experiences. His authenticity and unique style have earned him a dedicated fan base, and he continues to be a notable figure in the contemporary music scene. Yeah, he seems like such a genuine human being. Yeah, well, one when you're when you got a name like Jelly Roll, you're probably not fake. Yeah, yeah, very humble. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Exactly. Yeah, his and, his wife Bunny. Yes. <laughs> yes, interesting couple for yes. sure. <laughs> no doubt about it. The the the, the dichotomy of a, of a of a couple is pretty yes, amazing sometimes. Yes. But right? it apparently works, so good for I, them. You know, yep. that's what they say. All right, let's move along. We are in the, the get this. Are you ready? A new one. A new one. David Evans and Associates Studio. Who the heck the are those name? guys? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it's cool Kent's that never I heard get that to talk either. about the never company I work company. for now. Okay, all right. A little bit about David Literal Evans. Literal shameless plug. A little shameless plug, <laughs> yes. David Evans and Associates, mm -hmm. a.k.a. DEA. We call him DEA. Is a recognized leader in the design and management of complex transportation, land development, water resources, and energy projects nationwide. They combine... The talents of engineers, surveyors, planners, hydrographers, landscape architects, and natural resource scientists to provide their clients access to a complete range of services. That's a long sentence. And Straight you gotta, from the website. You gotta add in one podcast host. And one podcast host, yes. <laughs> <laughs> DA is consistently ranked among engineering news records, top 100 peer design firms in the US, and among leaders in many of their local markets. To find out more, visit DEAINC. Dot com. How about that? Uh, it's Good different. stuff. Yeah, I, Good it's, stuff. I think it, I, I like I, the variety. Yeah, yeah, I like I like checking up there. Yep, yep. It's going to be a good year, no doubt about it. All right. Next up, we have the Airworks. What are we doing? Quote or trivia tonight? Uh, I have two quotes. Today. Two quotes. So to find Airworks, go to Airworks.io. Yeah, they're one of those really smart. Uh, you know, a software like yes. they, when the dot is like dot io, you yeah. know, it's something super techy and Indeed. above my head. Hundred uh, percent. So I picked a couple uh, since it is the new year. I picked a couple of uh, New Year's ish quotes. Cool. Uh, the first one, and I, I liked it because it was it made me think a little bit, and I still don't know what to think about it. But uh, a worthy New Year's mm. resolution, perhaps, is to take no hatred into the new year without requiring it to restate its purpose. Okay. As long as you take the fortune cookie with you into the new year, you're good to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I like that. It made me think a little bit. That's good. I like it. And then uh, this next one's pretty is is a right up our alley, I guess. Uh, uh, I hope that, and this is definitely for you. I hope that in this year to come, you make mistakes. <laughs> because if you're making mistakes, then you are making new uh, things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself, yeah. changing your world. You're doing things you've never done. And more importantly, you're doing something. Mm, I think a lot of that is going to happen this year. All the above. <laughs> I hope you make a lot of mistakes this Let's year. Let's circle back uh, on Jan January 1st next year. Okay. We'll right. see how that All goes. Right. Let me put a note in my calendar. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have the GeoSearch job of the week. So this week's a little bit different. Uh, this week, GeoSearch, this comes from their uh, career corner professional pointers. Okay. So ah, this is okay. ways to supercharge your job application. Ah, okay. Tip like number it. one, All right. craft a standout resume, tailor it to the job, showcasing your unique skills, include a cover letter that highlights how your skills and experience align with the job description, express your enthusiasm for the position. Uh, are you saying don't ask chat GPT to make me a resume? <laughs> I, it, although chat gpt could probably create a pretty I, good resume i no, no yeah. don't disagree tip number two highlight your achievements don't just list tasks showcase your accomplishments be proud of that 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Tip number three, keyword magic. Sprinkle relevant industry and technical keywords throughout. Okay. Uh, tip number four, light up your network. Make sure your LinkedIn profile is current and professional. Connect with other professionals on LinkedIn. Attend industry events, both virtual and in person. Hey, I'm a huge LinkedIn person. Big right. believer in LinkedIn yeah. for so many different Did reasons. Did they put uh, another tip when you're in LinkedIn? Go ahead and follow the... Uh... <laughs> you didn't, but you did. <laughs> Thank goodness. And last but not least, tip number five, ready for exciting new opportunities. Visit geosearch.com today. Check out their job board and connect with their team. Yeah. Geosearch, I like this, your compass to a brighter career. Ooh, mm. that's, pretty, that's pretty catchy. Really good, really good. All right, here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. We're going to get our guest Let's in here. Let's get our guest in here. Of course, our guest this week is sponsored by Geomax Positioning. You can visit them at geomax-positioning.com. And we have Linda Foster with us this evening. A little bit about Linda. Uh, born in, I'm going to butcher this. I should have asked her before we got on here. Chadron, Nebraska? Maybe? Is that close? Chadron. Linda? Chadron, Chadron, Nebraska, grew up on a cattle ranch in the far southwestern corner of South Dakota. God bless her. Uh, she obtained her bachelor's degree in geological engineering ah, from yes. South Dakota Mines. School, school of Mines. Yeah. And uh, her master's degree in GIS from Penn State University. Nice. Mm -hmm. Free in her free time, she uh, she pretty much spends a lot of time with her family. But she does like love mountain biking and photography. She is the global manager of land records and cadaster at Esri, and she is proud to be in an executive leadership position with the National Society of Professional Surveyors, currently serving as vice president. Hmm. We'll get more into that, I'm sure. A lot going on here. And last but not least, she's, I love this, passionate about the fusion of all things geospatial. Oh, that is right up our alley. Man, oh man. Linda, welcome to the Geoholics. Thanks for being with us. Oh, and thanks for having me. You bet. You bet. Um, hold on a second here. <laughs> You all right? I didn't have this pulled up. All right. Um, we started out typically with the Trimble Geospatial Icebreaker. This one's pretty deep. And I'll be curious if Sean, especially, I know you didn't read it before the show, so you're going to have to think about it. But here we go. Imagine, <laughs> imagine you had the power to change one societal norm. What would it be and why? Who wants to go first? I already got mine. You do? Yeah. Jump right prepared. up there. Jump right up there. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to steal one from one of our previous guests. Really? And uh, and not necessarily, but I, I'm going to steal the, uh, I, I, the the quote that I still have on my board is, take the shame out of failure. Okay. And the societal norm is, ah, is uh, failure's not good. Is the failure is not good. I like it. I like it. That's good. Way to go. Linda, you got one? I do. I, I think right. I would have to say oversharing. That's, that, that's just something that, you know, as time goes on and time yeah. goes by and, you know, we're all in, in technology and we all have grown up through social media and it just yeah. amazes me how much people will share and where wow. they share it and how they share it. Such a good one. Like, I do not care what you have for breakfast this morning, Kent. <laughs> And I don't need to see a picture of That's it. That's my wife that posts that. That's not me. <laughs> How about you, Nick? You got one? Yeah, definitely wearing pants. Totally overrated. Totally, totally overrated. Totally. Yes. I, <laughs> it works, though. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I guess they have some purpose, yeah. They do have a purpose. <laughs> uh, what about you, Kent? What do you got? What is my... <laughs> Looking at Sean. You're looking at here. me for inspiration. <laughs> I think body shaming. Is, ah, yes. Okay. That's bad. It's so bad because, like, in the societal well, quit norm. At me, quit looking at me when you say that. <laughs> societal norm is, you know, everybody needs to be skinny and in shape and beautiful and this and that. And, oh, man. And I think social media probably plays a massive role in this. And it's just. Well, but it did exist before. It did, of course. So. But the social media definitely didn't just, get any better. Yeah. Yep, times a gazillion. Yeah, right. I, I think a lot of people would agree with you on that. Okay, uh, let's get to know Linda a little bit. So, Linda, you grew up on a cattle ranch. That's interesting. Uh, do you have any memorable experiences, or is there any way that, you know, growing up that way may have shaped your values and perspective on life in general? Oh, most definitely. Uh, 
tons and tons of memorable experiences. You know, <laughs> that could be a whole episode all of all of its own. But <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, uh, unbelievable experience. I mean, it teaches you so so many really valuable lessons in life. Um, when you're basically making your living off the land, or you're dependent on the land to sure. to survive. Uh, it, it's pretty humbling. I mean, it teaches you grit and perseverance because there's so many factors that are out of your control, uh, mm -hmm. obviously with nature and climate and mm -hmm. weather and living, breathing, you know, sure. creatures and things like that. Um, it's, uh, but it's also very rewarding. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of pride in, in what you do accomplish and the successes you have. So I think really what it did for me is provided a, a good baseline of just grit, you know, being able yep. to persevere through and and um, keep on going even when things are, are not going your way. Yeah, yeah. I love the, the perseverance, uh, resilience, obviously, and uh, work ethic, right? Right. Some would call it orneriness. I mean, I guess you could label it that, oh, too. Yeah. But <laughs> You know, you're in great company. I, uh, I read recently Jeff Bezos, you know, one of the most uh, wealthy men on the earth. Uh, he grew up on a cattle ranch in Texas and with, on his grandfather's ranch, and he attributes – a lot of his worth that get work ethic and things similarly to you, Linda, uh, to what he mm -hmm. learned on, on, on the ranch. Yeah, for sure. Big believer in that. Um, hard work breeds good work ethic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yes, it does. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Hey, geoholics. Quick shout out to Monson Engineering. Monson Engineering is the leading supplier of surveying, GIS mapping, scanning solution products for the design build industry in the Intermountain West since 1974. Man. When were you born, Sean? <laughs> Not then. They provide cutting edge design build technologies and supplies including Trimble GPS, Teledyne Optech 3D scanners, Spectra Precision Total Stations, Tiny Mobile Robots, Emicent Hover Map 3D scanners, DGI drones, Sokia levels, and Topcon lasers. These guys pride themselves in being your one-stop shop throughout all the phases of your project planning to completion. From drones to lasers, total stations, or high-accuracy GPS equipment, they have what you need when you need it. To learn more, go to monsonengineering.com and be sure to let them know the Geohawk sent you for those deep, deep discounts. Um, so one thing I didn't mention, you are a PLS, GISP, Correct. and uh, MGIS. Tell me what MGIS is. MGIS is uh, Master of Geographic Information Systems, so that's the nod to my graduate degree right there. There you go. There you go. So I wanted to establish the credibility there. You see what I did? That's a lot of letters. It's <laughs> a lot of letters, yeah. I started misspelling them when I was typing this in. Um, so at Esri, tell us, tell us about Esri. What do you love about, uh, about working for a company like that? Oh, Esri's fantastic. Uh, it's a purpose-driven company. Uh, if there's a problem, we want to solve it. And, you know, it's, it's a very passionate group of people. Um, from all corners of the world, which makes our teams extremely diverse and and multi-dimensional, and just uh, really the passion, and we have such a strong community as well. Um, you know, we're we're mm -hmm. really well connected to to our user community. There's a lot of direct access and a lot of collaboration, and which really makes it a joy to be able to participate mm -hmm. in that and watch. You know, people have needs and and. You know, the needs change over time. Obviously, our challenges change and things like that. So it's, you know, it's never a dull moment. There's always more to develop and try to figure out how to conquer. Yeah, yeah. That's a great answer. How many, like, how many people does Esri employ? Do you have an idea? I think Esri Inc., I think we're over 5,000. 5, um, so when I say, yeah, Esri Inc., that's a core yeah. Esri. But, of course, we have a distributor network and, and those mm -hmm. types of things as well. Yeah, yeah. And you've been with Esri for how long? I'll be going on two years. Two years. So here cool. in the here in July. Yep. What were you doing before that? So before that, I I worked in private consulting for 17 years. Um, so consulting, engineering, and surveying firm, um, okay. regional firm, and essentially built the geospatial program in that company from the ground up. So it was it was a blast. I I loved consulting as well. Got it. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> I suppose there are moments, right? as we all know. There are moments. <laughs> yes, there are. And deadlines, uh, lots of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I got to ask about uh, having a or getting a geological engineering degree, and I mean that's that's close to me. I'm a I'm a geotech guy. Um, so talk a little bit about how you got 
started with that and kind of how that got you into your career path now? So geological engineering, really, I, I guess I was drawn to that because of uh, my roots growing up, you know, in a resource-based environment. I loved being outside. I was intrigued by rocks and dirt and, you know, maps and all of that, that type of stuff. And when looking around, uh, you know, dollars and cents played into it. Not a lot of, not a lot of money there. So looking at, you know, state schools that, that would provide some opportunity and found mm -hmm. geological engineering and like, Hey, this looks pretty cool. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, there's a lot of variety in it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, like any young person, you kind of pick a path and start walking and see where it takes yeah. you. And it ended up taking me, you know, my career is like everyone's, you, you have twists and turns and yeah. you, you set out expecting that it's going to be this in your mind. And, you know, as you learn over time, it, you know, quite often is very different, which mine was, uh, but in, in all good ways. So. Sure. I have to wonder, growing up on a farm and constantly being in the dirt and digging ditches and all that stuff, maybe that led you to it, like, subliminally. You never know. Why did you assume she digs ditches? I, that's what you do on farms. <laughs> you dig things, Fun I fact guess. for you all here that probably nobody knows about, about me. My great-grandfather was a land surveyor. And really? my grandfather, awesome. yeah, my grandfather, same side of the family, was also, he never went to school for geology, but he was, like, a geology nut. I mean, he was one of those guys that, yeah. you know, has boxes of rocks and massive collection. And so it, it's, it's always been eerie to me. Like, hmm, I wonder if that was a genetic thing or just I coincidence. See. I don't know. See? Uh, Interesting. Oh, geez. Uh, there's Linda sharing with us. <laughs> Yeah, really. And, uh, We're getting deep now. Your, you know, your genealogy there, but uh, that's great. So, how did you go? And then we talk about a little bit about the tra how did you transition? You know, you just didn't wait. You didn't graduate geological engineering and then say, you know what? I think I'm going to get a master's in GIS. Like, how did you transition into into that field? Yeah. So, interesting story. Um, I was introduced to GIS really actually in high school. Believe it or not. I was a student working for the U.S. Forest Service and uh, back in the command line days and, and what have you. I had a little bit of introduction there, uh, hung over a digitizing table in the summers, you know, with the puck digitizing. Mm. Oh, yeah. Hated it, swore I would never, never deal with GIS in my life, you know, so that set the, the trajectory for me. Ended up in uh, one class in college, but also got introduced to land surveying in college mm. through my geological engineering degree. So fast forward, when I was graduating, geological engineering is, of course, resource heavy. You would think mining, petroleum, oil and gas, or environmental. Uh, at the time I graduated, resources were in the, in the gutter. Um, markets were down. Mm. Uh, hiring was not happening. <laughs> and so, you know, that's where one of those twists or turns happens in yep. your career. And I always envisioned being in an oil field or, uh, you know, in a mine, working in that type of an environment. Uh, but then I ended up... Um, getting hired in this civil engineering consulting firm, engineering and surveying. And uh, I had done GIS through all of my internships. It just kept coming back to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just, whatever, but couldn't shake it. You know, it kept coming along. And then pretty soon I was like, started really embracing it and seeing how it could all, how it all works together, how it comes together. Because I was a degree engineer, I had the engineering background for that type of problem solving, but then also having the geospatial component as well, you know, I could see things maybe a little bit differently. And so that's what really led to me launching a, a geospatial division in a private consulting firm. Mm. Interesting. 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 So um, we could go a bunch of different directions with this conversation right now, but <laughs> let's keep it on the straight and narrow. Um, right. So I want to get a better understanding about, you know, what a, day in the life at Esri looks like for you in the position that you're in as global manager of land records and cadaster? So great question. And part of why I love my job is because it's full of variety. I, I'm a person that I love variety. I love change. I love different things, learning things. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic position for that. As you might imagine, um, being a global position, there's been, you know, a pretty good learning curve for me, learning uh, the global nature, the global nature of our industry, wow. surveying around the world, land management, land administration around the world. Um, but it's very intriguing. And, you know, really my role is bringing industry insight in inside the company to our teams, to our, our folks that are working, you know, 
uh, and building what we build, but also taking the cutting edge technology that we're working on inside the company and bringing it back out into industry. So, uh, so we can infuse it out, you know, to all of our user communities and all of our folks that are doing the work every day. So as you might imagine, that's a lot of variety. You know, there's all kinds of different things, teams that, that I get to be a part of, uh, obviously events and activities and um, leadership roles, you know, in, in industry. So just, just a tremendous amount of variety. Um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, talk about learning something new every day, jeez. Yes. Does, does it allow you to travel quite a bit then or? It does. I have the opportunity awesome. to, to travel far, far and wide, which is really, really neat because you, you just meet so many incredible people and learn, like I said, the differences in surveying and geospatial and how similar we are around the world, yet how different, yeah. different we are uh, as, a, as a profession and, and how we practice and our challenges. Those are the things that are really intriguing to me. Uh, as you go along and, and, and learn those things. Linda, um, I'd be interested. So, you know, in the, in the GIS community and the survey community, you know, sometimes, you know, in the past didn't always get along the greatest, uh, you know, there's a fun acronym in the survey community that's, you know, GIS stands. Yeah. We won't talk about that. Um, but you, you have such an interesting position because you are at the, the pinnacle GIS company of the world. Right. And, you are at the top of the survey chain within that organization. So you get to like experience the nexus of GIS and land survey and engineering and CAD and all these kind of, you know, Venn diagram of, of per geospatial professions. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts, like how that, have you seen that transition? And, you know, like, do, do you see, do you feel acceptance in these different GIS markets? You know, like any insight into that GIS survey potential friction or now love relationship or good question. I like that. It's a great one. And really, you know, I would say it's, it's still a work in progress. Um, I've seen a tremendous amount of change from my career, the early days in my career. When I started, you know, I like to laugh and say, I felt like I was walking in the headwinds all the time because, you know, I felt like I, I could see the value and the benefit and we were applying it successfully. We were, we were growing good business by, you know, integrating all of it essentially by, you know, leveraging all the different pieces and applying them to what we were trying to do for our, for our clients and our customers. At the end of the day, what we were tasked with is to solve our, our customers' problems, right? And our clients' problems in the best way possible. But it wasn't popular. You know, I mean, at the mm -hmm. time, most people didn't see it. They didn't get it. And there was yep. a tremendous amount of friction in the industries. Yep. Uh, that's evolving very much so. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't certainly say that it's, it's reached equilibrium at this point, mm -hmm. uh, but we're well on our way, uh, you know, and there's a lot of, of things. I'm sure we'll probably get to talking about more of this as we go through the evening here, but there's been so much change uh, in the last two decades. Let's just park it at that three decades. If you want to really get down yep. to it, that I would say really is when the evolution started to happen, but um, definitely we're, you know, we're, collaborating, we're working together. Uh, the vision I think is becoming clearer uh, across the, the spectrum of the professions. And it's, it's a really exciting time, you know, because it is, there is a lot of change. Of course, we have young folks coming in with fresh perspectives, different ideas. Mm -hmm. We have a generation of folks that are retiring out. And so that, you know, creates opportunity, creates change, different perspectives and different dynamics. And so it's, yeah. it's a super exciting time right now, I think for, for all of us. Yeah, yeah. And this, I mean, don't get me going on this because I mean, I, as a professional surveyor for 30 plus years, um, you know, I, I, I think surveyors missed the boat when it came to GIS. And now there's a incline of the number of GISPs and a decline of the number of PLSs, you know, so yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, we talk know. about that too much. Every, like every college has a GIS program in <laughs> You know the number of you know and, and surveyor those, geo, geo those programs are growing and the survey departments uh, yeah. are, are eliminating so yeah 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 so Linda on that note though I would be curious you know from your uh, NSPS perspective um, you know what what input do you have on, on that situation as far as the direction that NSPS is going in that vein well I mean just like looking at you know looking at the direction surveying is going versus the direction mm -hmm. that you know the GIS profession is going. 
you know, I really think that they're converging in many ways. Um, you know, we we obviously still are working on, you know, defining, delineating, figuring out, you know, the roles specifically. Um, but really and truly, there is so much. I like to look at it more as we're we're kind of walking in partnership, the two communities, or we should be. Uh, yeah. by and large, because of, you know, it, it all comes down to what, what's the purpose of what it is you're doing? You know, what, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what are you tasked with? What are, what's your responsibility and, and, yeah. and how should that be best carried out? And, you know, they the work that land surveyors traditionally do, the work that GIS professionals do, it's coming, it's merging together more and more. Yeah. And I have a diagram that I, that I love with, you know, it's an upside down triangle. We've got geodesy at the bottom and then we have land surveying oh, yeah. and then we have, you know, I, everything up to the digital twin all wrapped yeah. up in the wrapper of GIS. And so really we're, we're all in it together. Sure. Um, sure. And, and I, I think you touched on something just a little bit ago about like the younger folks that are getting involved in these professions, mm -hmm. like even the, the younger surveyor that comes out of college is kind of like a hybrid, you know, they've, probably had a bunch of GIS classes in addition to their survey classes. And uh, they're more, uh, I don't, I don't want to say accepting of GIS, but the older generation of surveyors, you know, the ones that are, you know, at the retirement age now, that type thing, right. you know, um, as, as they ride off into the sunset and these younger surveyors come up, I definitely see that convergence happening. For or sure. it's like that Venn diagram <laughs> starting to Oh, so yeah. They could become one, and yeah. now there's not a, there's only a couple outliers that yeah, don't yeah. fall in both. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We need to work together. It's everybody's benefit. Absolutely. Especially surveyors, because they're they're behind. 100. <laughs> you're not wrong. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you got something? Nick? No, I was just thinking to myself. You know, here in Texas, we have two programs that I'm pretty familiar with and associated with uh, at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Uh, at the Conrad mm -hmm. Blucher Institute, they they're there. We have a four year surveying degree, and they absolutely it's surveying and GIS. I think it's mm -hmm. literally in the title, uh, but it is on a path to licensure. You you are going to do be an RLS, but you you absolutely have to take those GIS mm -hmm. classes. They you 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 come out probably with your Part One Hundred Seven drone stuff as yep. well. I mean, so they're you're getting a plethora of tools. Um, so I, I would agree with that, and even. Um, the other school I'm associated with around here is uh, the Austin Community College I've talked about before on the show. But mm -hmm. ACC, they have several hundred students a year, and uh, it's the Geospatial Engineering Program. So, yeah. like, you can learn Ooh. CAD, you can learn GIS. It's a two-year program. And, I mean, 200 students a year. Holy cow. I mean, and, and those students are just getting yanked up as fast as they're coming out. And so I see mm -hmm. that fusion happening as well. Um, so just, just think it through it a little bit, but. Yeah. And I no, think I... that that's a good point, Nick, because as with anything, you know, our industry is, is rapidly changing. We're seeing a lot of change. And of course, the education institutions, you know, are in it with us as well. And they're trying to figure out how to best adapt, how to equip, you know, students for the current industry needs. And so, I, you know, there's transition, I think, happening there as well in how the programs are structured, what they're teaching, um, you know, some are very immersed, some are still, I would call more traditionally uh, survey oriented, you know, but we're seeing, I think, more of a fusion across the board in those education programs as well. And I think we'll continue to see that yep. as we move forward. Yeah, you know, and the thing is like, we're all measuring, right? And not everything has to be measured by a surveyor, right? We have to come to grips with that. Um, have you? Me? Oh God, yeah. Okay, I'm fine with it. Oh, yeah, all right. All right. just yeah. checking. I'm too old to have that argument. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no argument. It's uh, I, you yeah, know, yeah, it, yeah. It, and I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, and it's like sometimes you know it's like you know, GIS doesn't have to be survey grade accuracy all the time. You know, so it doesn't take a surveyor. I and mean, Nick can talk about you know the the equipment that they have. It's ideal uh, for for GIS mapping in addition to survey, of course. But um, does that make sense? Though? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it doesn't surveyors get, get this thought in their minds, like everything has to be survey grade accuracy, you know, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't. I think it really comes back around to purpose again. You know, what's the, what's the end what, user? What's, right? what's the end goal? What's the purpose? And even mm -hmm. myself as a, as a private practitioner for, you know, many years, being both a, a registered land surveyor and also a certified GIS professional was very interesting because mm -hmm. I did work in both. I did professional 
projects, consulting work in both. Yeah. And there were times that I had to be very critical and very careful in reviewing what they were asking me to do. What is the end goal and what, what are we, you know, doing? Because is that, you know, am I carrying surveying liability into this task or, or mm -hmm. is this a, a, G, a purely GIS type of a project? Um, and there's times it gets difficult to separate those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to work with the customer to help educate them on the differences. But, you know, by and large, you, you get there, but it, it is, it's, it all comes down to, to really purpose. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. And that's a good segue into uh, kind of like, we always talk a little bit about technology and what's the new stuff out there. And I'm curious on your side, since you do have you know, both perspectives here. How do you see the future and, and how the technology is going to in, influence, you know, GIS? Well, the convergence how, that we're yeah, talking yeah, about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you, what do you, how do you, where do you think that's going? Well, from the beginning of time, technology has been a disruptor, right? I mean, yep. we can, we can rewind all the way back to, you know, the crews that were breaking down the, uh, the land in our country, you know, during the public land survey system days, you know, and how they yep. worked and roll in, you know, tens more decades and look at how we're doing work and then look in the last 20, 30 years, how are we doing work? Technology is always going to be a disruptor and it's always going to, um, you know, you can look at it as the glass half full or half empty. You know, it, it kind of depends like how you're, how you react or perceive the change that's happening, but really it, it provides opportunity, you know, in one form or another, the, the changes that are, that are bound to happen and, and will happen and are coming with new technologies will inevitably create opportunity. We all know sometimes that's a long game. I mean, if we think about how long GPS, I mean, look, we're celebrating 50 years of GPS, right? That's I mean, insane. Yeah. isn't that crazy? That is and, crazy. <laughs> and, and you put that in perspective and think about, you know, 50 years ago, we started down this road and here we are today, everybody running around with, you know, one of these and, yeah. and knowing where we are all the time. And, and, um, but that was a 50, 50 year run, you know, really from, from beginning to now. Um, one that I love is, is LIDAR because mm. when I was still an undergrad, I remember standing in a trade show as a student and the first, one of the first scanners was there. And I'm like, Oh my God, look at this. You know, this is amazing. And of course yeah. we didn't have computing power that could handle it or, but, right. but the thought and the concept was mind blowing. It's like, wow, well, here we are, you know, 20 some years later and, it's become a real reality. Like we're, we're putting it into practice and, and, and doing it. So technology excites me. I, I love it because you know that it, there's constant, well, like I said, at the beginning of the show, I love change and challenge and, you know, yeah. that type of thing. So I think yeah. we're just, we're in for more and more of that, you know, talking about convergence, technology itself has matured to the point, you know, where we have, well, connectivity for one is a huge game changer. Having internet anywhere you are, pretty much, or wherever you might want to be, huge change disruptor yeah. for how we work and what we what, what we can do and how we can do it. Um, computing power, you know, how much storage you can have. I mean, you can buy four terabytes and a little drive for peanuts. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> and and so I mean, just think what that you know what all that has done for us to this point. I mean, we're just just stepping into the AI arena. You know, I shouldn't say we're just oh, stepping yeah. in again. AI yeah. has been running around in the background for a long time, but it's becoming, you know, it's evolving. It's, it's, it's starting to come out and, and um, become more mainstream. So well, and I was just is... thinking of the, that when is the, at this point, data storage is like no longer a limitation anymore. It's like, yeah. oh my God, I'm at a, I'm, I'm at a hard drive space. What, yeah. what the heck is this? This is unacceptable. <laughs> and then why don't I have a terabyte everywhere in every device? And that's it's it's incredible. Just, and that happens so fast, yeah. right? Yeah, no doubt. What do you got, Nick? Well, I was, well, I had something else, but I was going to say, you know, as long as you have iCloud, you can have as much space as you want. I, I mean, right. I, I turned 40 recently. I remember in the mid nineties, I uh, got a virtual boy, which was a uh, virtual reality. It was a Nintendo system and it failed within the first year. Uh, it was so terrible and it gave you a headache. It was red. It was terrible. Oh, yeah. I literally took it back to Best Buy. Actually it was Circuit City. Uh, they don't exist anymore. Don't and exist. I traded I it in for a six, one chip of 64 meg RAM. 
not even DDR RAM. Oh my God. So it was like six hundred dollars for one sixty four. Like a, a gerbil runs faster than that. So I, you know, it's all relative. You know what we can do today. But Linda, you were talking about technology, and you know, we talked lidar and stuff like that, or Insar or things like that, or SAR. But I'm actually curious in the Esri ecosystem. Is there anything interesting in the world of technology that surveyors, you know, geodesists or even GIS people, anything you're excited about that in Cadester or how technology is even maybe changing the Esri platform? I think yes, resoundingly. I mean, all the things we just talked about are are huge um, game changers. You know, one that's that's been mainstream for for quite some time now but continues to open amazing doors is is the cloud platform is the ability to have as much computing power and as much storage and as much accessibility as you could possibly want and and big data like what we can do with big data is just absolutely incredible when you talk about analyzing you know i mean of course at esri we've got the living atlas and we have we have some big data and it's just amazing that you can now it's realistic to be able to take that data and do analyses and and solve problems and and do things that we never could have imagined just simply for that one sheer fact that we have that that availability uh, you know i think ai is going to be huge in many in many facets um yep. of course you know being global it's one of those things that you know not everywhere in the world is the same as we are and so it's thinking about how other countries uh, can what can they access what do they have the ability to um, use and and leverage and those types of things and so those are all things that you know constantly play into um, you know you can push the tech out as far as you can possibly push it but at the end of the day you know there's kind of that backfill of knowledge expertise of uh, access um, you know those types of things that ultimately have to kind of come in and backfill. So there's always, I would say, a wide range in there of, you know, are we looking forward or are we kind of nurturing and maintaining and, and you know, continuing to, to mm. take care of what we already have uh, available? Yeah, and I think the ability to collect data has changed significantly because it used to be you'd spend whatever, twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a GPS receiver, whereas now, plug for bad elf, um, you know, Nick talks about the democratization, did I say that word right? Of uh, Close of GPS, uh, and how that is changing things. So I'd I'd like to hear, you know, both of you um what their what what your opinion of that is. Linda, please start. Yeah, you're the you're the guest. Which, what do you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, short answer is yes. I mean, we have the ability to collect data like we've never been able to collect data before, um, both in quantity right. and I would say in quality as well. Again, that, that accessibility piece has become so much clearer for so many of us now that was never even a possibility. You know, having, having VRN networks, having the ability to step out of your truck and get going, you know, check into your control and boom, we're, you know, we're in, I mean, you're not setting up base stations and radios and, you know, all of those workflows and things that we were used to doing. I, it really has. And the thing that really I ponder a lot is we can measure, we have the access to be able to measure highly accurately, more accurate than we've ever been able to measure before. Mm -hmm. um, the downside to that is the understanding of how, how, to use it and what it's you know what it means and like i said early on in the show we're we've become so uh from a consumer standpoint we've become so i think used to having location in our hands everyone you know mm -hmm. grandma grandpa you know your brother or sister your whatever you know that's not in the in the profession or the industry are using their phones for spatial things every day for ubers for dinner deliveries mm -hmm. for finding the restaurant you want to go to it's everybody has location in their hands but the thing that I see so frequently, uh, and, and especially when you drill up in deeper into what we all do in the geospatial arena, is a, is a deeper understanding of where that location is originating and what it means. Um, that's where it starts to get interesting for me and where, I wouldn't say it, it scares me, but it, it, it makes me give some pause to the fact that location, you know, is in everybody's hands. 
Mm-hmm. Well, what does that mean? You know, well, it's yeah. it's great, it, but it it does have some some consequences too potentially. Yeah, Nick, you, what are you your have thoughts? To, you have to go a little further on that. Like, what what are those? What do the consequences look like when everyone has location in their hands? I turn mine off. I don't want anybody to know where I am. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, you yeah. of all people. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I can kind of address that, Sean. Maybe, maybe just my opinion, and and for Linda. Um, so recently, I was on this uh, a discussion group called the Geospatial Connections, and I was making a plug hmm. that we have a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we have all these really neat technologies and co- quantum computing coming down the pipeline. Um, what's happening because of the computing power is a lot of the analysis of these big data you know, the big, large uh, sample training data sets, they're now being analyzed and reviewed by non-geospatial people. So you get a a computer science degree and a CS degree, and you go learn how to program, and you get hired on by whatever company that asks you to go use data to create apps, and you don't care about location. You care about math inside of a program. So the problem becomes in the GIS world, for an example, and in learn, land surveying for some degree, we've been analyzed like geographers. Let's just say geographers. Like we've been analyzing the earth for a long time. And so we bring a whole expertise of place and space and topology and these understandings of geodesy, but even cultural uh, geography. And I'm just afraid that if we don't stay on top of it as the geospatial professionals, people that have no business analyzing geospatial are going to do it. And then what could be missed? So yeah, we collect all these data, but, but what, who's analyzing it and are they making all the connections that we should be making? And are they looking at it from a spatial perspective? The other thing, going back to your question, Kent, was on the GPS and that democratization. I was on the horn today with what you would call it in the Esri land, like a tier three city. So this is a city in like the 80 to 100,000 person range. And this is actually a very big popular city. If I named it, you would know it right away, but, uh, and probably have been there. Um, But they were talking to me because we're looking to roll out a large solution for them beyond just hardware. But, you know, they have, they have like 16 divisions within the city and they all need something different. The garbage man needs to have enough accuracy to know that they're in the lane, in the road. The guy going and collecting the tree at a park needs to have a whole different setup. And the surveyor that's hitting that subsurface utility engineering in the right of way to bring fiber in for equitable fiber under beads, like um, the broadband stuff, like they need to be at a centimeter. And so we, we are for the first time able to like put the right tool for the right trade and it all can go out there and it and no longer is like a $40,000 gig. I mean, like I was like this past weekend, I was out at my property with my wife and I threw this up on LinkedIn and I think you saw it, Kent, but I was flying my drone. My drone's like $700, you know, like, and the amount of data now I'm like, if I fly at 150 feet, I have a quarter of an inch resolution. I can create a <laughs> 45 billion points for my piece of crap property. And it's like, why? Who cares? And and then you start to look at it and the spatialness all gets wonky. But my point is for like for $700, you can go collect yeah. a whole lot of data, right? Um, so that I, I'm kind of digressing in the two different fronts. But I think to summarize, I would like to see geospatial people stay involved with the analysis of data that has spatialness attached to it. And I think it's a very neat place to be where we're collecting data at different varying levels based on the need and the industry, the person. And then also we're collecting data in mass quantity as well. So like the idea of a smart city where cities of the future are going to run off of location-based devices and, and cameras and sensors and, you know, everything is going to be dictated on an algorithm based on live data feeds. Um, that comes inherently with with collecting data and whether it's from a satellite or from you know drive through the city and tell me a traffic stop that doesn't have a camera attached to it mm. you know you you attach yeah. a photo recognition software to that you you, you could start mapping traffic patterns you you know what i mean you could you could immediately mm-hmm. start doing so many things so it's an interesting place i mean 
I think, Linda, you've talked about, you know, we're in this kind of fusion of all geospatial things all of a sudden. Mm. And it's just a neat place to be. It is. So where does it go? Okay, so we're going to fuse all these things. What do you who's, see? Who's going to yeah. be the grand poobah of <laughs> geospatial data? Who's that going to be? We might be talking to her, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote for Linda. I'd vote for <laughs> Linda. Totally. <too>. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so we know what the, you know, you know, Nick did a really good job of, of talking about what, what you can do with some of that fusion. Yeah. Where do you uh, assume that we're fused? Yeah. What, yeah. do, what do you think that where, looks like? Where are we like, trying Linda? to get to, right? Yeah. yeah, what do you think that looks like? And you, I believe, have a very unique perspective on it. I think ultimately what that looks like, and again, I always step backward. I, I kind of step back and look at my experience thus far because, again, you can look ahead and, and I mean, just be blown away by the, the, the possible, right? We, we all know we're heading into some incredible times. We're, we're heading into some things that we can't even imagine yet. I mean, there's things underway that just, I get totally excited about that probably won't go into production for another five years, you know, maybe 10 years. Uh, but that being said, and by the way, about... I wanted some specifics on those after you get done speaking. But please, please <laughs> He's like, I need to go buy some stock in these yeah, companies. Right. <laughs> he's got Robin Hood up and he's going right. at it. <laughs> gonna dig, gonna dig one bite at a time. So, but yeah, so it, it's an interesting thing because if you, you know, where I think we're we're all headed is how do we better manage our built and natural worlds at the end of the day? Because you know, when you, you just go all the way back in time for surveyors, you know, from the beginning of time, think about how much we could survey as human beings with the the tools we had. Yeah, it took a long time to survey, and I mean. I, it blows me away when I retrace, you know, as a land surveyor, the, the PLSS um, notes of, the, of those those crews and those surveyors, it absolutely blows my mind what they were able to do and how much ground they covered. But put that in perspective versus, you know, what we know we can do now from a data collection standpoint. But one thing that I like to to kind of think about, and I think is something we really need to work on, and that is data is really Spatial data to me is an infrastructure. It's it's a critical infrastructure, and you know, okay, here we are in this time in our in our country where we're investing like we've probably never invested before in new infrastructure. We have a unique opportunity right now to capture digitally that asset. As and to me, that's every bit as much important as it is putting that pipe in the ground or paving that highway or whatever it is you're doing in the mm -hmm. project. And in the past, we've always kind of looked at those in bite-sized pieces. You know, we did a project, we shelved it. We did a project, we shelved it. Oh, we has built it. Well, that's red pen on a set of plans, right? So where it's headed, I think, is, is systems upon systems that can talk to each other and that we can look at in broader perspective rather than go into one public works department, for instance, and start digging through their records. Maybe that's in filing cabinets. We're doing better. We're getting a lot of that out of filing cabinets and maybe scanned. <laughs> we have a lot of we have a lot of investment locked up in paper still. In in and in the generation that's retiring, we have so many individuals who worked for decades in the same agencies, and that knowledge is up here and it's retiring. Yeah. It's walking out the door, and so we're losing a huge amount of our legacy information or knowledge um, about our world, about our built world. Uh, in those types of things, we have an, an opportunity to recapture or to capture that and do a better job moving forward. That's not an easy problem to solve because technology is very capable, but there's a lot of people, a lot of policy, a lot of systems and things that have to be in place. But I think ultimately where we're headed is, you know, comprehensive systems of systems that can talk to one another and that we can that we can easily access and make better decisions with. I mean at the end of the day. And, you know, I've always had a thought about, you know, all the data that it, like I said, is locked up. Think of the value for those of us that have worked in consulting. Think of all, all of the time you spend on the front end of a, say a design project. Where do you go? You go pull legal records, you pull land records, you pull easements, deeds, you know, 
every job you do, you start over and you do you you go through the same pattern, the same process. Imagine if all of that information was right at the at, at your fingertips and you had a you know you could accelerate that from a time standpoint and think of the the money savings too. Um, and you're starting to uh, broach into, I mean, you know, you do need to make a living, Kent. And if who me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if and if there was no, and if it was all at your fingertips, you, your your proposal just went this big to this big. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll be part of the solution, though. Sure. Of making everything available at your fingertips. And this goes to a con- to a conversation we've had before. Okay, so that say in that scenario, that same mm-hmm. process now is not a $20,000 survey. Is it still a $20,000 survey even though half of it doesn't need hours anymore? Yeah. It's oh, I pushed this button and I have all that at my fingertips like Linda said. Mm-hmm. So, Linda, I'm interested in your perspective, given mm-hmm. what you just said, in yeah. the consulting world and all of this great stuff, how, what, what would that look like uh, if, like you said, instead of having to go through all the records to build that, whatever it is, boundary or, re, you know, put mm-hmm. it back together, if it was right there, should that cost be half or how do we, I mean, I'm, I'm opening a question, but... How do we account for that? And how, and what does that look like going forward when, if and when, I'm, I shouldn't say if, when it is at our fingertips mm-hmm. and there's no more paper records to get, to recreate the, the boundary, so for example. I think it, I think it's like anything, it, it, it'll evolve. Hold, hold on, hold on one second. That was the longest question ever. I know, I'm working, on, I'm working on my long questions, I, I, but, <laughs> but please. Sorry, go ahead, Linda. <laughs> I forgot what was the question, but just no, kidding. No, no. <laughs> let, me, let me start over. <laughs> I'll see how good your memory is, or mine for that matter. <laughs> you know, it's a great question, but I think I think it's one of those, at least from my perspective at, at this point in time, I view it as more of an evolution. Uh, yeah, I, our fee structures will probably change. That'll probably look different. Um, but I don't think that it's necessarily anything to be scared of. Um, and in a way, I think it's a positive because think of all of the time that you would potentially free up to do more or something different or added service. Maybe you, yeah. maybe now because you're not burning so much budget on recreating the wheel every time, right. you can add on or enhance or do more mm. um, with that customer, provide better value, greater value is how I look at it. Uh, if you don't have to go through and do those tasks every time. And, you know, I get a lot of people that say, oh, AI is coming for us. It's, it's all over. You know, it's going to take our jobs. It's not going to take our jobs. Um, it's going to change our jobs. It's going to change how mm-hmm. we do our jobs. Uh, we still need a person, an individual, an individual to carry liability, if nothing else, <laughs> the way we yeah. currently practice as land surveyors sure. in this country. Um, you know, but even if you don't have to do all of that time-consuming work anymore, it frees you up to do maybe better and different things, maybe more. And where we do have a, you know, a de- we know we have a deficit in the workforce and land surveying right now. We know we do. We're retiring out more than we're bringing in. Um, so I think those are positive opportunities, quite honestly, um, to be able to work more efficiently. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe you're able to put out more, more projects. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love result. that perspective. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, 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 great perspective. But the thing is, we have to adopt the technology. You know, don't don't shun it. Don't be stubborn. Like mm-hmm. a lot of surveyors are, unfortunately, um, adopt that technology. Well, I, and, I, and I was even thinking to to what Linda was saying. Not necessarily the surveyors that are being stubborn, but you mentioned building new infrastructure. It's that municipality, mm-hmm. and, and they should and, welcome you it. have. And, and maybe Linda, talk a little bit about your experience and. How do we get the municipality to uh, adopt the, you know what, I probably want a a terrestrial scan of this project instead of, a, a, now, okay, now it's a PDF with red marks on it, but yeah. still, yeah. how is that experience going in, in changing the, the discourse on, on or what, what the cities can accept? But I also think on that note that the deliverables are right. changing. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Right. They very much are, and this is part of that complex web I kind of alluded to earlier in, you know, you can push the limit all the way out 20 miles, 
from a technology standpoint, but what you have to really work on then is what comes in behind, and that's exactly what we're talking about now. How do we get the the government agencies to embrace, adopt, um, be open to these changes? Uh, and there's a lot of factors in it because you know, one we just we've talked about it tonight. Aging workforce, you know, mm -hmm. what generation of individual is in a decision-making role, perhaps in that agency or organization? That will probably have some some bearing or impact. Yep. Change generally, there has to be a catalyst for change, in my experience. Sometimes people are very progressive, or you have the right individual that's that's pretty forward-thinking, and they'll take it and run. They'll 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 do it just on their own. Other times, there has to be some kind of a catalyst for that change to happen. So, you know, maybe that's regulatory, maybe that's policy, maybe that's financial. Uh, maybe, hey, we've gotten half of our staffing budget axed, and now we got to figure out how to do more with less. And that's that's happened a lot in the last few years. People are all of a sudden going, we cannot physically do all of the work we need to do. We have to mm -hmm. find a way to do it differently. Right. And so those are all things that, that play into it. And one of the things that's intriguing to me from a, an as-building perspective, for instance, you know, that's a piece of this that when you look at how a, an infrastructure project gets built from cradle to grave, you know, when you are out on the front end planning and then you're mm -hmm. surveying it, then you're designing it, then you're bidding it. Well, we're seeing a lot of change in how that's even happening. You know, we're, we used to be design, bid, build models in our, in our projects. That was how I came up through the ranks in, in building projects. Uh, then, you know, when I was getting later in my consulting career, things were starting to change to design build. So we're, we're, we're stepping up the pace. We want to move these through faster. Uh, you know, construction manager at risk type contract models were starting to come in. What that does is it changes how the pieces of the um, project get done. And so think about how, it, where did as building always fall traditionally? On the contractor generally, right? quite often there's a very specific contracting mechanism that kind of drives how that gets done and who does it um those are t those are things that will have to shift or change uh and i think we're seeing it now with just the like i said the, the contracting mechanisms even in our industry are, are changing and that will i think inherently help probably um encourage these, you know, these delivery mechanisms to evolve into something, mm -hmm. um, you know, more, more modernized, if you will. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned like cloud, you know, the cloud infrastructure and collaboration connectivity. I see, you know, a lot of deliverables now, instead of having to, you know, print out your 24 by 36, you know, and, and roll it up in your, your case and roll down to the city, you, you can submit these things online. You're, review process online, like you mentioned, it's it's speeding up the whole, you know, A to Z soup to nuts uh, mm -hmm. process. It really is. And, you know, the other part of that, of course, comes back around to liability. And that's something that we're, you know, I think as an industry, we're still working through. When you submit a set of plans, you know, there's something physical and static there. You know, you can lock it up with a bow, stamp it, sign it, seal it. And, you know, whether that's a PDF or that's a a roll of paper, you know, what have you, there's there's some finality there to that product. I think we have to, you know, we're shifting how we're thinking about that. And when you deliver digital data and you carry liability as a land surveyor, design professional, uh, how do you ensure that data, you know, how do you lock up that liability, if you will? How do you um, keep that, um, mm -hmm you know, integrity intact, if you will. And so, you know, the industry is really working hard on that right now and figuring out, you know, I envision a time when whoever is doing the construction observation perhaps is in the field. Um, maybe they're doing the as building while they're out there, you know, yeah. depending who has the, the contractual obligation. That, well, yeah, what she said. We've talked like about that. Yeah. The, the, the democratization of scanning, right? Because mm -hmm. the cost of scanners are coming down to the point yeah. now where anybody can have one, right? Just why not set up a scanner and... Do your thing, right? Yeah. And, and, and I mean, it could be the surveyor. You know, they, they're doing the as building for them. They're standing there with a connection. They could be sending that data back to the, to the customer in real time. And yeah. then it would probably sit like in a version for review or, you know, it would need to be reviewed and approved, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, to go through its, its checks. But I think we're, you know, we're there in, in the capability. Yeah. It's figuring out how do we, you know, yeah. contractual obligation, liability, all of those things that go along with with how we do work. Yeah. And it's like, who's going to be the trailblazer, 
You know what I mean? Well, to, and and I mean, we all want to be the trailblazer, but there is a point of of uh, equity. You know, it mm -hmm. it still needs to be equitable for all of the consultants to be able to provide as built for a government agency. Mm -hmm. And if all of a sudden the government agency is like, you know what, I'm only going to accept a cloud a point cloud file from a terrestrial scan for as built going forward. There you go. Well, that just locked out. Uh, you know, yeah, twenty percent of the consultants. Well, yeah. I can't afford that. Or they're not right. ready, but but some people would think, okay, that's a good thing. But yeah. are you really being equitable for the community as a whole when the one guy in his garage still needs a sh the same shot as the other guy? Yeah. Yeah. That and this just came up recently. Of I I want to a, a lot of the shift in liability is from that construction observation person hmm. onto the surveyor to as built something that is really the inspector's job. But yeah. the inspector wants the measurements, and I can only as built measurements. Yeah. But I can as built, uh, but I can verify something was installed. Yeah. The surveyor as built measurements, and that's supposed to all come together. Sure. And that gets shifted around to yeah. the city saying, "No, I want the surveyor to tell me that is per the d the detail." Yeah. Well, I can to a point. Yeah. And what will eliminate all of that is scan the whole thing. You want to know how wide the road is at any one spot. You got it. You got it. Right. Why not? But then how do we get from where we're at now where That's like Linda's saying. saying the technology the is definitely there? Mm -hmm. How do we blaze the, work, the through? workflow and the acceptance? Yeah, yeah the acceptance. That's the challenge. And then yeah. and then how I think Linda mentioned it earlier, how do we connect those systems so they build mm -hmm. the bridge next to that with a different contractor and it now crossed over the city lines? Yep. How does that Still, you know, and then we may create more of a problem because, well, sorry, that one was scanned and that's still on a piece of paper. We're going to make Sean a surveyor yet. <laughs> <laughs> he can talk the talk as good as anybody. Kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think I'm more interested in GIS, but uh, <laughs> yes, I don't blame you. All the fun, no liability. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I didn't just say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> Well said, Dr. Nick. Well, if Uber can think my house is still my neighbor's house, then I like that that level of accuracy versus... Uh, well, don't forget, I already bought your house in the metaverse. Oh, that's right. That's so right, you're right, living yeah. on borrowed time. I am. I am. Eventually, eventually you'll, you'll be my <laughs> landlord. I am so excited to talk about Carlson Software. Founded in 1983, Carlson Software specializes in CAD design software, field data collection, and machine control products for the land surveying, civil engineering, construction, and mining industries worldwide, providing one source technology solutions from data collection to design to construction. Oh, yeah. Carlson Software's renowned dedication to customer service is unique in the industry. Their software suite is designed to complement land surveying operations and provides a variety of survey features to process data from surface modeling to least squares network adjustment. Users work seamlessly between the office and the field by utilizing company-wide design styles for ease of use and efficiency. And I can say I have personally been using Carlson since 1991. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 1991? Yes. How is that possible? Oh, my God. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> time flies when you're having fun, that's for sure. But back in 1991, when I was introduced to Carlson, it was very apparent to me that their software products simply think like a surveyor. It's so easy to use. Their customer service is second to none. And uh, I actually went to Maysville, Kentucky for some training and played golf with Bruce and, uh, and his brother. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. Nicest human beings on the planet. Um, highly recommend Carlson. To find out more, simply go to carlsonsw.com. Be sure to let them know the Geoholic sent you. Oh, man, so funny. Um, I could go, I could talk about this topic forever, but we got to move along here. And I do have a couple of things I want to make sure that I ask, uh, ask Linda about. Um, one of the things is I was really excited to see that you are your state facilitator for the, uh, for NGS, for the LDP, for the up and coming SPC 2022. Yes. It's 2024, right? Upcoming 2022. Oh, I know, I know, I know. But Yet this is come. a great opportunity Coming soon. for me to ask somebody who's on the inside, what is the status of this? Can I get a quick, quick 
give me the the Wikipedia version of what you just said and what it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Linda. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> So at the core of what you're asking is it, it, it is about the National Geodetic Survey's NSRS, National Spatial Reference System Modernization, which is an effort that has been underway for, I think, gosh, what's it been a decade at least. Um, and this this really cuts to the core of what I was alluding to earlier when I said, you know, we all take for granted where things are. We all know where we are. We all know where things are. But do we really know where they are and what are they relative to? So why is the NGS doing mm. this NSRS modernization? What, what's really going on here? And I get this question constantly, like, God, it's kind of like, you know, the book, Who Moved My Cheese? You know, whatever, that, that leadership yeah. book, change, why are we changing? And, and those of us that work in geospatial know you already have a gargantuan list of coordinate systems and projections, and God, I don't know which one to pick. And, well, that dictates where our data lands, right? When we're working with it and where it really is that matters. So what the NGS is wait, wait, doing- Wait, Linda, which, which one is Hem and which one is Haw? Sean is Hem and and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Kent is Haw? Which one is refusing to go get the cheese because he's fat on the mm. cheese he's already got? That's a good one, that's a good one. Careful how you answer this, Linda. Yeah, careful. <laughs> I'll defer, let's get back to the datums. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so what's really going on here is um as everything that we've been talking out talking about tonight is about evolution it's about fusion it's about convergence uh the same is said for you know we really we have from a, ge a geodesy standpoint in our country we have uh essentially a framework that we work off of you know that when we go out in the field with our gnss our gps what is it you know relative to what's it based on when we are working in state plane coordinates what is that based on well what's going on right now is that the current datums we're working on um there's a bit of a you know a bit of a, a shift if you will so it's not truly centered you know on it's not earth centered earth fixed if you will for simple terms um and when you think about satellites what are satellites using as their control point quote unquote you know, where, what, what are they relative to? Uh, so essentially what the NGS is doing is updating our datums to be in better alignment, if you will. Um, so there's a slight tilt, there's a slight rotation, you know, angle. Mm -hmm. they're, they're taking care of that, they're fixing that. And then at the same time, we have the opportunity to create low distortion projection zones uh, in our states for work in the state plane coordinate system. Well, what does this mean? Why, why do we have all of these? Why do we care? Why do we need to care? Um, and, and so for those of us that have worked in infrastructure, worked with the design side of things through, through time, uh, really um, going to a low distortion projection, you're trying to get that scale factor down to one as close as you can get it. Yeah. You don't want any distortion. Yeah. That's the goal. You don't, you don't want to have the contractor have to apply a scale factor when he's building something. And so the NGS, you know, along with the NSRS modernization went, hey, you know, here's the opportunity to update our state plane coordinate system zones. Uh, obviously, they didn't have the horsepower to do that. Uh, and also, I think, and rightly so, they felt that it really should be tackled by the stakeholders themselves or those of us out in the field practicing in a given area, state, region. Um, and so, huge undertaking. I mean, my hat's off to the NGS in, yes. in, in taking this on because absolutely um, amazing amount of work that went into this, each state that's participated. Um, so from my state's perspective, when this started to come around, I went, man, you know, we would be really, um, we would be really remiss to not jump on the wagon and try to participate right now. Why do I say that? Well, because this is probably the only opportunity, at least in my lifetime, that I can foresee we'll have a wholesale opportunity to be part of the national framework, if you will. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, you can create low distortion projection anytime. I mean, there's states out there that use them now locally, you know, they're using them. What it means though, by participating with the NGS is that all of the vendors, my company included, 
the big rigs that everybody's relying on and using will have those definitions in the in the software and in the hardware and they'll be standardized and they'll be accessible and it's a little bit scary because we're going from something like what 160 some to 900 and some odd zones yeah. last i heard across the, yep. the country um but yeah so really that's the reason that I was motivated to do it is I saw a small window of opportunity for our state to participate in this and improve how we work, um, especially from a design and construction standpoint. Our DOT was a huge champion and part of, of us getting this moved forward in our state. But like I said, surveyors will be practicing against this for, you know, like I said, probably, probably the rest of my <laughs> lifetime or career. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I think the, uh, the end goal is amazing. And, you know, getting to that point would be incredible. And you mentioned the number of zones. I think in Arizona, it's like 40 zones maybe we're up to or something like that. And that's just because our state has a lot of relief in it, right? Yeah. Um, but I think, right. I think some of the flatter, you know, center of the country type states probably, I don't know, you could probably speak to that, Linda. I mean, the number of zones aren't nearly that much. Our state's 26. And, you know, we're the eastern side of the state's relatively flat. We have the Black Hills area yeah, of course uh, yeah, it has yeah. a pretty substantial amount of relief in it but yeah uh, yeah we're, we're 26 zones is where we ended up yeah with our designs and how many did you have uh prior to this uh this modeling two oh really <laughs> <laughs> we had a north, a north zone and a south zone <laughs> wow well that's oh. i mean arizona only had what three right oh. east west central so, um, so Linda, do you get a sense if, if you had to put an over or under and make a bet, throw a hundred bucks into the ring, when do you think it actually gets implemented? Jokes. So aside. from my experience and, you know, I've been pretty closely uh, involved with it where the process is right now is like for us, for instance, we have finalized design. So those parameters are, you know, essentially we we actually just finished the final, the final check. Um, of our, our designs. Now, the NGS has released, I believe they released it back in July, the alpha site. Uh, so you can actually go out there right now and check out every state's um, alpha zones, if you will, the parameters, uh, um, the zone boundaries, where they are, what's going on in your state. And I would mm -hmm. encourage everybody to do that. It's, it's in GIS, yeah. it's a web GIS app. And you know, one of the questions I get all the time is like, oh, we've got all these zones. How am I gonna know what zone I'm working in? Um, yeah, right. That app you can pull up on your phone, hit your location services, walk out your door, and you can see which zone you're standing in. I mean, you know, it's it's a pretty cool. You know, we have yeah. tools and ways today that to to deal with some of these things that we we wouldn't have had in the past. And so, the NGS is doing a great job at trying to get it out there. Um, my fear is, I think people are still in that. Eh, it's not out yet. Whatever. I'm not going to worry about sure. it or think about it. Let me know when it's actually final. We're very yep. close. Um, I would say 2024, uh, what we've been told is it'll go through government review, you know, the regulatory and standards bodies will will be moving those things through. And then once once the stamp gets put on those, then it'll be it'll be real time. Yeah. So I think sometime this year, by the end of this year at least, probably we'll be ready to roll. I know the big big vendors at least i'm sure i know ngs has put a tremendous amount of effort into working with vendors so, um to so be ready S spc 2022 will come out before the complete deprecation of ArcMap. i'm gonna hold <laughs> you to this I'm, I'm putting it in my journal <laughs> no comment <laughs> no, comment. <laughs> no oh, by the end of the year that would be that would be fantastic do you yeah. think uh, we'll have a high adoption rate i mean there are That's, yeah yeah I, great question we had agencies in Arizona that were still running NAD 27. So, exactly. well, and that's where, you know, we have a, the work is, I, I mean, as arduous as it was, believe me, uh, because I was heavily involved in the design of our zones and, and that process. Now that the math is all behind us or whatever, the big job is just beginning. And that is to educate our user communities, educate, and that's everybody. I mean, that's educating surveyors, GIS professionals, photogrammetrists, um, anybody that's in the geospatial industry and and like we've talked all night tonight about high accuracy we can measure with high accuracy and, and those types of things well this conversation comes right into it because mm -hmm. we have to really understand 
you know, what we're working in, what we've defined our work in, good metadata, and then we haven't even really talked about the dynamic nature of these new datums, and that is now we have time and movement factored into what's going on. And so that is a piece of it. You know, most people stop at the, how many zones did you say we're going to have? Mm-hmm. And you, you don't even get a chance to open the door about the dynamic yeah. nature of, of the, these datums because they don't, that is really hard for a lot of people to get their minds around. What does that Wrap mean? What do I do? It, yeah. How do I do it? You know, so we're just in the very early stages of figuring out how to, you know, how are we going to handle all the legacy data that's out there that may or may not have mm-hmm. decent metadata? Um, there's going to be a lot of work to yeah. be done, but I think the biggest thing that, you know, my hope is in the industry is that we can get some good baseline education out across the industry. Um, awareness, if nothing else. Stop and think about what you're doing, how you're doing it. If you don't know, you know, ask someone who can help you out. Um, because the last thing we want to do is collect a whole bunch of high accuracy data that's really not because we don't know enough about it. You know, when we go to use it five years from now, if we don't have critical pieces of metadata, we've lost the value of that information because now we don't have what we need to um, use it, you know, in an, in a prudent manner, if you will. Yep. And when you talk about high accuracy, that stuff really starts to matter, you know, and I, I, I'm sure we'll have a big job in the GIS community in education as well, because for so long, it's like, that's ah, good enough for GIS. It's like, well, when we start talking about digital twin and, and mm. the fact mm-hmm. that we can have high accuracy data, we need to, be a little more careful about that and not be quite so flip and say, well, it's just GIS, you know, we shouldn't care about that. Well, we all really should care about it. Yeah. Uh, and again, what we're trying to do with it. So that's yeah. interesting. That's a, a lot, a lot to happen someone, here in the next 10 years. That's the first time I've heard someone talk about the GIS world getting closer to having to pay attention to accuracy yeah it's usually exactly what linda said like yeah don't worry about it it's just gis it's a yeah it's it's a it's a wide marker so it it doesn't really matter but yeah Yeah, just change the line type width yeah yeah, exactly just just make it a little wider it'll be fine right but uh, that as that convergence it's all going to have to be essentially the same and i I don't think the survey the term survey grade is just even going to be a thing Mm -hmm. in 10 years it's just going Mm -hmm. to be yeah this is where it is this is it yeah that's the spot and i i have a a term i like to say you know the high cost of underutilized data i want people to think about that because high cost of under- the high cost yeah. of underutilized data i like so that. If, if we're not so careful true. in how we collect our data and how we document our data i mean that's fundamental 101 of anything surveying gis you name it is good metadata and if you if you don't do those very simple tasks, you've eroded the value um, of that data, and and there's a high cost to that, and it kind of circles back to what we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, repetitive, constant having to handle, deal with, research, pull the same information over and over and over again. You know, it's the same thing. If you go out and collect data and you intend to put it into a system for use years and years into the future, but it's doesn't have the right metadata or enough metadata, really it's, it loses its value. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's a great point. It really, um, really is. We're running a little bit long here, but I do have one other question I want to ask you about. Um, sure. So you wrote an article, The Power of Not. I was wondering where that came from. And <laughs> I read it today and I thought it was genius. So I would like for you to talk about it just a little bit. So that really just, you know, I don't know, I guess maybe I had too much time on my hands over the holidays or something decompressing, I don't know. But just, you know, and reflecting back across my my career and thinking about, uh, I, I'm a different duck. I mean, I'll admit it. I, I'll read the magazine well, backwards. Well, you're a surveyor, so you know, I, that explains I, that. Kind of contrary anyway, but just reflecting on how did I end up where I am? Because as you guys can see, you know, I, my journey's been interesting, I guess, to a degree. Winding is I would Winding. <laughs> winding and uh really and truly it's very simple i can look back and go it was all it was all decisions um and our lives are all decisions each one of us that's that's our journey that's our path and it's how you look at those decisions that i've really come to realize really is where a lot of power is held and i've often been one that went why not why not try this why not 
give it a shot. You know, maybe it'll be painful and, and fail. And, and especially in the consulting world or in earlier in my career, I mean, I'm a curious person. And so I like to tinker. I like to try things out. I like to push the envelope. And But many, many, many times through my life, I mean, it, I've been met head on with the why. Why are you doing this? Why would we do this? Why should we do this? Why, why, why? You know, and I was like, why not? What do we have to lose? You know, it, obviously you have to weigh that, but that's that's where the power of not comes from. You know, add the not on to why when you're asking that question. Yep. I well, love it. Why not? Oh, Let's yeah. do it. <laughs> that is right up our alley. I love it. <laughs> all right. All right. Hey, that's all I got. What do you guys got? Well, I I have to, I always ask this question, and I think you just said it. Uh, so I'll ask it, and you can say it again. Uh, do you have a mantra that you live by? <laughs> oh, boy. And, and is it why not? No. Okay. My family, my family would say I have one, and you'll have to wait for me to die and let them carve it on my tombstone to find out what it is. But no. In all seriousness, <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, it'd probably be uh, till you can't. I, I've always been a person that's, and that's a little bit cliche. You know, there's a song, Cody Johnson song, "Till You Can't," but it's really, it's the way I've always lived, and it's like, well throttle to the floor until you can't anymore. You know, I mean, you keep going in a direction until you can't, and then you change and adapt and you keep going again. Or, yeah. or maybe Linda's you... pretty fun on a Saturday night. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In a nerdy oh, sort of way, right? Hey, that's, that's okay. Right. That's all right. We're going to process some mad data on a Saturday night. <laughs> Until we can't. Until we, Until we can't. Until the, literally the computer blue screens of death. <laughs> Takes right. the edge off of designing LDPs. <laughs> that's great. Oh, it sounds like so much fun. Uh, uh, what about you, Nick? What else you got? Anything? No, I think this was great. I really like the discussion on the the future coordinate system. You know, it's it is yeah. it does pop up quite a bit. You know, in my travel. So hearing, and Linda, you talk about it pretty positively. You know, not and every in some yeah. shadowy corners, it's not as positively spoken about. But it's it's nice to hear the other side of it, and it is exciting because at the end of the day, it's going to make the entire system better. Yeah, is it going to mm -hmm. be hard? And is it like you mentioned, technology is disruptive. Uh, yeah, you know, just mm. random side I saw the other day. Did you know in Rome they had a point of beginning point that mm. in the center of Rome, all measurements on every Roman map went back to that central POB point, that one monument? I thought that was so cool. That's two thousand years old. So awesome. if they could figure out a datum two thousand years ago, we we got this. So, no, Linda, I really appreciate you coming yeah. on and. Uh, keep, and if keep, there's keep if the, there's a positive going. note to end on on coordinate systems, I would say this: the coordinate system modernization is what's going to allow us to get to that vision that we talked about of cohesive systems of systems being able to talk to one yeah. another. Uh, I liken it to language. You know, if you're sitting in a room with someone who speaks French and Spanish and German. Well, you have to know what each other is speaking in order to translate it, and you know it's the same thing in in spatial sense as well and and that will help us all quote unquote be in this on the same page and able to talk to one another mm -hmm. spatially so nick i got a, i got a suggestion that? for you um when you have those conversations with the naysayers saying in the dark corners in the dark corners like why do we have to change this again just simply say why not there it is <laughs> <laughs> except my wife's like why are you in the dark corners what are you doing yeah. there? <laughs> that's right <where I> <laughs> Why, Why would not? I not be oh, in the well. dark corner? Because <laughs> I got to bring that's light. Awesome. No, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, no, Linda, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Absolutely. I have really, yeah. really enjoyed it. Thanks um, for having me, you guys. It was, it was a pleasure. You bet. We'll do it again for sure. Sounds great. All right. Adding value, making friends. Again. Check that box. Right. If anyone would like to be a guest on a future show, or if you have any guest suggestions, shoot us an email at info at the uh, We'd love to hear from you. Jelly Roll, need a favor. Mm -hmm. Available everywhere. Until next time, everyone. I got a few notes here. I'm sure you do. Technology creates opportunity. Mm -hmm. Technology has matured over the last 50 years, but I haven't. <laughs> Clearly. Be a catalyst for change. Think about the high cost of unutilized data. Go from why to why not. And most importantly, as always, be safe and healthy. Only pray for mine, got the prayer. So tell me.
me who 